Hello everybody, uh, my name is Chris and I am the uh, co-curator along with uh, Bill Mazoulis of this screening series Unknown Pleasures, which is um, a, a program that yeah, we've been running for about three years now, it's devoted to Australian independent and underground cinema. Um, Bill can't be here tonight, he's uh, working steadfastly on his new feature film in Adelaide, um, so I'm here in his stead, but I'm really, really welcome, um, happy to welcome the wonderful uh, Sydney filmmaker Margot Nash and her film Vacant Possession, which is the film that we're screening tonight. Um, this is one of my favourite Australian films, I think perhaps ever, and it's been several years uh, in the planning of wanting to bring Margot down to screen the film with her, so we're unbelievably happy to have her here. Um, yes, definitely down to the um, we're not going to talk too much uh, longer. We are going to do a, about a 25 to 30 minute Q&A after the film, so please stick around for that. Um, but we do want to do a, a particularly special acknowledgement of country for this film, um, both in, and you understand why when you see the film. Um, so the, the film um, speaks to concepts of land and indigeneity in a really profound way um, through Margot's perspective and through the perspective of the central character whose story the film is. Um, so we wanted to do an acknowledgement across both uh, lands of uh, in Sydney where the film was made and also here where we're screening. So um, we wish to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional custodians of this land and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, this is, was and always is and will be Aboriginal land, Indigenous land, First Nations land, and um, we wish to acknowledge that uh, at our screening. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land, the lands on which we made the film, the Gadigal and Bidigal and Camigal um, clans of the Eora Nation. Uh, this is a new one for me. I went and looked it up today, and this is La Perouse, and um, that's the coastal area. The southern coastal area is the Gat, the Camagal, and the um, northern coastal area is the Bidigal. And I'd like to acknowledge um, them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for these lands, and acknowledge that these lands were all, of course, never ceded always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And um, the title of the film is, I'll just say briefly, um, really a pun on the whole principle of terra nullius and it was made in the, the, the run-up to the Mabo decision which overturned that principle in law in Australia and terra nullius of course means um, empty country, empty land and... Um, so I was playing with ideas of that, and which of course it wasn't empty, and also of a little house, and you'll you'll find out about that in the film. I hope you enjoy it, and we'll come back for a Q and A later. Thank you. Some dreams you remember as if they were real. Others are like fragments that float away never to be held. This dream returned to me again and again. I knew it was about home because it started here, on a boat, heading for Botany Bay, birthplace of a nation. My birthplace. My home. The heads lay in front of me like the entrance to a womb and the great land whispered behind it. All I could think of was that my mother was dying and I wouldn't reach her in time. In the dream, I thought of her mother and her mother's mother. I followed the links in the chain, one by one, back to the ancestors. Prisoners. Sweating and hungry in the dark holes. I thought of my father and his father's father. Fear of the unknown gripped me like a cold chill. All right, where to start? Well, I suppose, Margot, that the, the, uh, yeah. there's so many entry points to the film, literally, because the whole film is built around liminal space, so you can really come in and out at any point. but. I thought we could start with the idea of the very first 
seed of an idea and where that came from? Oh. <laughs> going down to La Perouse one day with a, my friend Jan Mackay and she told me a story about the big house down there which was used to be a boys home and um, it's now the La Perouse Museum, it's, it's, it's great and um, she had an aunt who'd worked there and she, um, I don't know, she it just intrigued me, the, the location and the, the idea of the, the boys home the idea of home of, of, of Aboriginal children, of course, who'd been um, removed from their families and kids who'd been incarcerated. And um, I just started thinking around that and, and, and the location, I think. The location I found very powerful and because uh, um, the Aboriginal community has been down at La Perouse for a long time and... Um, so that's sort of where it started, I suppose. But it 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 it, it also started, um, and I worked on a documentary film called For Love or Money. It was the history of women and work in Australia, and we we it was five four of us who made this that film over about five years. I edited it, and um, it. It was a real, um, it was my film school. I never went to film school. So making that film was my film school, but it was also my history lesson, my Australian history lesson. I really had no idea about um, what had happened in this country because uh, I'd never grown up learning about, you know, our history. Um, and the I read Henry Reynolds' book, The Other Side of the Frontier, and any of you, I'm sure a lot of people here are watching the, um, the the documentary series on the Australian wars that's on SBS at the moment, and uh, which is about the frontier wars. And Reynolds' book, The Other Side of the Frontier, sort of told about the wars and about that story from an Aboriginal point of view, from an Indigenous point of view, and it just completely blew my mind. I, I had no idea. Um, I felt so ignorant, and, and I was living in Redfern and which is another in, in, uh, Aboriginal community in Sydney. And um, I just became really in, a sort of... I remember cutting that whole sequence in for love of money about the wars and about the taking of the land and it had just really got to me. So I think there was part of me wanted to do something more. And in that process, um, you mentioned to me that, you know, your, your process is... There's a lot of reading and a lot of thinking that goes behind the writing of the films and that this project especially had a lot of that density built into it from i mean it feels like the accumulated index of a lot of thinking all throughout not only your practice but the practices of the people that you were collaborating with at the time and i wonder early on in the process were you thinking of pamela ray to play Tess, or was that something that came a bit later? I was actually. Um, I, I, I'd, um, when I was writing the script, I used to put pictures up on. I had a board with all these cards where I sort of w was plotting the story, and um, I'd have pictures. I'd pin on that board, and I had a picture of her up there um, because I, went, I saw her at Belvoir Street in. Um, uh, uh, playing Alice B. Tonkless to Miriam Mangolas as Gertrude Stein. I just thought she was... Pamela was just a knockout, you know. She was so fantastic. And um, I thought, oh, she'd be great. <laughs> and uh, she was American. I mean, she's Canadian, not American. She had a Canadian background, so she's got that little accent. But I did give her a backstory with, um, you know, having been in the States, being a gambler and all, all of that. Anyway. And, and in that, that process of developing the character, I mean, how, how closely did you develop the character with her once she was cast and, and how much of that informed her perception of the role and her perception of that history, given that she, she wasn't natively from Australia? Um, she 
wasn't really involved in the, the... The script was fully developed and funded before we, we approached her. Well, I think I had a pro tried to approach her, but when you haven't got money for something, it's so much good talking to someone. But <laughs> uh, when we actually got the money, you know, I wanted to talk to her, but the casting agent wanted me to look at a lot of other women, which I did, but I, I came back to her and... Um, and then when um, I finally said, no, I really do want to cast Pamela Ray, and um, she came on board, uh, we had rehearsal. We had rehearsal period. And with film, it's, 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 she was coming from Monday Theatre, used to, and I, I'd had a bit of background in theatre too, and creative development projects and... But film, you, you're lucky to get a rehearsal period and I, I fought for a rehearsal period and we had a, a terrific um, sort of workshops. We did, we did quite extended workshops and uh, developed not so much... I think what we did was develop backstories for the characters that weren't in the script and also just did improvisations around... Um, situations and uh, rather than rehearsing the lines we rehearsed the emotional backstory and and um, created emotional memories for the character that she could draw on when she was playing the part and it was not just for her it was for all the char all the the actors uh -huh. I did a different kind of rehearsal and within that process, was that where you sort of really introduced the actors to the idea of the time slippages and how that they would function within the film? What was that like for them to play? Well, that was always in the script. You know, I, I'd always wanted to play with time like that and, 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 and put... I think it was one of the things that attracted um, the Film Commission to funding the film was that it, it was using those... I was very... I really wanted to, to try that thing of putting the main character and her mother when they were much the same age in the frame at the same time and um and and that slippages back into the past and to memory dream reflection i was very into jung at the time and um so it's a lot of memories dreams reflections and um yeah the the um I think people went with them. I think people were curious and certainly working with Dion Beebe, who was the cinematographer, um, in working how we... You know, I, I painted a storing board. I mean, I painted not every scene, of course, but anything that was difficult, I, 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 I painted. I, I, I drew and then I, I painted. And um, that was great for me in as my preparation and, um, and in developing how we would do those slippages with Dion was through drawings and storyboarding and discussions. And I don't think the actors had a problem with it. Um, I think people were curious about whether I could pull it off or not. It's fascinating because it, it, what you managed to articulate through film form is is not only the pull of memory, but the pull of, of, of past traumas and the way in which those past traumas uh, have a flattening effect on the sense of time between past and present. And so for, for a performer, in fact, who's being inculcated into the process of uh, mimetic recall and thinking about mm. what, how the body embodies those memories, mm. Mm. it, you know, you, you're just sort of further enacting that on screen. It's not partic maybe particularly that difficult for an actor to do because they're already sort of doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were, and Pam was fantastic mm. in the workshops. And um, the, you know, Auntie Beryl, Rita, um, She'd never acted in her life. That was the first thing she'd ever done. And um, she loved the workshops, you know, and, and because she said, oh, all the, you're all just real people, aren't you? <laughs> you know, yes. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, the, I think to create the workshop time it was a bit more extended than I think a lot of films had. I really fought for it because, and I think the, the Aboriginal actors needed it too, to feel comfortable with the other actors and to be able to explore their characters and, um, yeah, and, and it's a culture that's, you know, has, is really um, so based in storytelling and, um, and past, present, you know, the past is present. Mm.
in the, the, the past the past is in the present too. I, th I think you know a large part of why that works so beautifully on screen is um, the way in which every element of film form is really fully integrated. It's very rare to see um, an Australian film that pays as much attention to all the different component elements of film form as this film does, which oh, is one reason why I really love it. I mean, just Dion's uh, sense of, I mean, the sense of movement, camera movement within each sequence is really incredibly fluid and sort of catches you off guard constantly throughout the film. How much of that sense of movement was something that was discussed uh, at script stage and how much was found when you were in the process of staging it on set? Dion didn't come on board until I had a script. And so it was um, really between script and shoot was storyboarding. And uh, as I said in the storyboard, every scene, only the really, the, the magical scenes, the difficult scenes, the, prob the ones that people didn't quite know what I meant on mm -hmm. this page. Um, and Dion was very, very engaged with, um, he did his own drawings and, you know, too. And we talked about, um, I had very definite ideas. I'm just remembering it so long ago. <laughs> um, I... Um, uh, I did a, um, I put a VHS together, a montage of uh, scenes from films mm. that had influenced me. And How that, much of Cirque was in that? The, <laughs> I didn't know about Cirque then, but Tchaikovsky was in there. And um, so, you know, the, some of the lighting in Vacant Possession comes out of Tchaikovsky, you know, mm -hmm. the... the sh the, the blind with the sh shadows across, you know, Pamela's face. That's, um, I showed Dion a film that had lighting like that and um, Bergman and um, I showed, um, I had Wizard of Oz in there where the house yeah, gets yeah. blown away. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, so there was a whole, there were, you know, beautiful films that I, I had loved, you know, Terence Davies' work and mm. so there, there were, I'd, I'd done this sort of compilation and I shared that with Dion and, of course, and um, and with the art department, the production designer and the costume designer and everything. So the, I had all these materials that I'd, that I'd collected. You are sick. You should be in bed. Oh, oh you catch your death. About a nice pineapple juice. Hmm? Come on, get back to bed. Clouds roll by a little. That's the story of, that's the glory of love. <laughs> Tessie, you've got to get well. Mummy had to take a day off work to look after you. I can't take two. Look, I'll let you listen to the serials if you stay in bed. Hmm. It was your grandmother's engagement ring, Tessa. And one day it'll be yours. Yeah, the costume really is a character in the film as well, as is the sense of place. Um, the way each of those elements are zoned according to, to the gender politics and culture and land in the film is very particular. Um, in your writing process, are these things that you... Are you... Are you, uh, are you conscious of trying to find a form for these ideas in the writing process or is it something that emerges through the process of doing as you get on set? No, very much in the writing process and I spent a lot of time down at La Perouse and down at Botany Bay and I used to go down and draw and take photographs and and put, you know, montage books together and stuff like that. So... Um, so like a bricolage, bricolage process. A bit of a bricolage process, yes. <laughs> and... Um, 
So, uh, you start with a linear story in that sense when you're starting to write. Are you starting from a treatment where you've got a, a linear story that you're trying to tell, or is it much more of a process of bricolage and finding these associations between things? Well, <laughs> you know, when I got the money to develop the script, I thought, oh God, what do I know? You know, yeah. and this is your I mean, first narrative film, really. Well, it was really the first narrative drama, big one, yeah. you know. And I'd made experimental films, which had been very intuitive and um, experimental. And so, you know, I got some of the books on three-act structure and all of that. I remember Peter Sainsbury, who, who was um, giving... He'd given me the money to develop the script. He was at the Australian Film Commission and I had a meeting with him. And he said, so, so Margot, have you read the books? <laughs> have, you read the, have you been reading, you know, the... Whatever he's, I thought he's, he's forgotten his name now, the big three-act structure fellow. Sid Field. That's the one. He said, have you read Sid Field? And I said, well, um, yes. Yeah, but it's kind of boring. I don't know that. <laughs> he said, I'll throw it away. <laughs> and um, so, but, you know, I've spent many years teaching screenwriting and teaching the three-act structure, but I also teach other forms of approaching structure but mm. I, I, it helped me but it didn't help me and bec but I was still I'd come out of theatre I'd, I'd come out of experimental films I still was wanting to to fracture you know the, that narrative in in, um, in visual ways and um, so I had a card system um, on the wall I had the white cards which were the narrative and then I had the blue cards, which was a dream, memory, reflection, whatever, you know. So then I could see the whole film and see where it slipped into the other place and how it came back, what the transitions were and what the balance of it, of it was. So, so you could move stuff around. And I could move it. stuff around, thank you. That's I, I right. I definitely follow that I still, I, I still like to work that, that yeah. way. I learned that from working on documentaries. Yeah, totally. That's yeah. that's how I work too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think the other interesting thing too is is I mean the film is one of the very earliest attempts, at least in the in Australian narrative fiction context, to, to dramatize um, the indigenous experience through a central uh, white female character's point of view. That isn't something that, and to put that in relation to the the colonialist point of view as well, and and to construct a character who is neither one camp nor the other really and inhabits this kind of truly liminal space which I suppose is one reason why the film falls through memory so often. So how complex was that? How the layering of that subjectivity throughout the writing process and then um, especially when you when you shot the film and you were editing, how much of that, because that, that seems to me the central challenge that the film yeah, uh, provokes absolutely. both in your, the film making process and in terms of the audience response. Well when I was developing it, um, when it was still at early stages, I knew that I couldn't get very far until I had an Aboriginal script consultant mm. and an Aboriginal consultant. And this was very early stages of script development. And I went down to La Perouse to the Land Council and they grilled me big time. <laughs> and, um, but um, I'd also, I found somebody, I found Cathy Singh who became the, the consultant. She's since passed away, very sadly, not that long ago actually. And um, she came on board and uh, I had a lot of discussions with her about it because I'd wanted to develop the Aboriginal characters more and she kept saying no the strength of this story is that it's a white story. Mm. And she she didn't... And, I, you know, I, I, I... Of course, I developed the Aboriginal story, but it was in relation... I was... Of course, I was thinking about colonialism and, you know... Well, it's also through, Pamela, through, through Tessa's eyes. So yes, it feels yes. grounded in an honesty from yeah. that, that subjectivity. Yes. And she was the one who said, you, this is... Exactly, you know, this is... You can do this. This is what you can do and I'll help you. And she stayed with the project all the way through and all the way through the shoot and she was there every day for the the Aboriginal actors to look, hold them and look after them, you know. And uh, she was the one who said, no, nah, take it away from La Perouse, let's put it on the other side of the bay because it's too hard, you know. The mm. community is really... It was really tricky and, you know, can't have, you know... 
you've got you've got to have your truth. You've got to tell it from from the white point of view. And um, yeah, so that's that was he was there for me all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was the re reception that you got to the film once it was released? In terms of not only it, its status as a film, but in terms of what it, what it's proposing in terms of the questions that it raises about uh, land and culture and, and the history of our country. Well, I think when it came out, um, it got some great reviews. Um, you know, it was critically well received, um, and uh, people wrote some very interesting things about it. And people who got it, you know. Um, David Stratton wrote about it. Margaret Pomerantz interviewed me on on the SBS on the movie show, and um, it's she was terrific. And uh, Adrian Martin wrote a great piece about it, and so the the film critics really liked it. And um, what about the response from the indigenous community? The indigenous, well, I think it was. I don't think they were sort of coming out in their droves to come to the cinema to see vacant possession, mm -hmm. and um, but um, I think when when it got a cinema, cinema release, Kathy was a bit embarrassed. To well, it was many white audiences who came, mm -hmm. and I think now. Um, well, Marsha Langton is thanked in the in the end credits, isn't she? So. Yeah, I, I sent a copy of the script to her. She ripped me to shreds. <laughs> Did she see the final film? Yes, she thought it was great. She yeah. showed, she actually introduced it in Darwin, <laughs> Detchet. So, but at the time, I, I can great. still remember being in my bedroom, <laughs> reading it, her, her response and weeping on the floor. You know, <laughs> so I'm like, oh my god, because I knew Marcia. You yeah, know, yeah. I, I mean, I, I knew her. It wasn't that she didn't know me. No, you no. Know, and I didn't know her. I, we, we, but she, she, she's tough. <laughs> What, what but, do you think she liked was, about the final film was, then that was um, different to the script? Oh, she was she loved the final film, but she and I think her really tough script feedback because I already put myself out there, you know, um, to to Aboriginal readers of the script and things. Um, it really helped me to to make a bit of to write a bit of script. Right? Would yeah. you say that a lot of that had to do with the winnowing down of the perspectives in the film? To was it a was it a point of view thing? Uh, not so much a point of view. It's, uh, uh, I've, I've erased it from my mind, <laughs> but um, uh, I think she thought I was trying to to talk about things that I that I, I didn't have the. Um, I feel like saying that sort of mana to, to, to speak yeah. about, you yeah. know, that, that that I was actually, t it was too ambitious in a way and I didn't know what I was talking about. And, yeah, yeah, and I needed, you know, when I talked to Cathy and we went, and she, that, I think it was around that time, she said, you've got to tell it from the white point of view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't give Marcia the script to read again. Cause <laughs> <laughs> but then I heard that she... Did a fabulous introduction when it, you know, at the Deck Chair Theatre up in Darwin, and you know she really liked it. I have, I have spoken to her since then. Yeah, 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 she liked it. So it seems to have made the film stronger then. By the oh, time. it made the film much stronger, of course. If you're strong enough to deal with, yeah. to, to take it, pick yourself up and go. Good point. Okay. <laughs> totally. Totally. It's a necessary part of the process. I think so. After you ran away, the police came round. They kicked the door and held us all at gunpoint. Mitch couldn't get away. He couldn't even walk. He was done for trespass and assault with a deadly weapon, a piece of wood. Seven years, Tessa, and he was just a kid. And your father got off scot-free. I hope a tiger snake bites him in the dead of the night. No one told me. Why didn't Mum tell me? She told me he didn't want to see me. I wrote him a letter. I took him that letter, but the screws tore it up. You know how they are. When he got out, he started drinking. He was on and off the grog for years. When he was offered, he was mighty. He worked the shows with Bluey, the snake man. He was good. 
but the big house and the grog bore him down. He had a heart attack, driving his car down near the mangroves seven years ago. He was 33, and he loved that car. Um, we've got maybe five minutes for some questions from the audience. If anyone wants to wants to um, ask a question, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sort of um, interested in you know where this film came from in terms of funding at the time with mm. the AFC. It seems like it was a bit of um, uh, you know a brief kind of golden period for independent filmmaking. I can't um, hear. Sorry, I can't hear very well. Oh, sure. Sorry, it's a question about funding. Yeah, what about yeah. it? Who who gave me the money? Well, I'm sort of. Um, yeah, I, I sort of feel like it, it seems like it was quite a, a brief golden period. It was a brief golden period. You bet it was, We're because it was fully funded. Mm. It was fully funded by the Australian Film Commission. They had a, they had a, um, uh, they fully funded one low budget independent feature a year, mm. and I was so lucky to get it, to get the money. Uh, they stopped doing it because I mean the thing is that vacant possession was not a smash box office hit. I can assure you, um, it keeps it. It got shown all over the world. It's been to festivals all over the world, and it keeps. This is the first. I wanted to say this is the restoration. We've done the big restoration. This is the first time I've seen it with an audience since it's been restored. I mean, I worked on the restoration, but um, it's still, you know, getting interest, but. It wasn't a box office hit and uh, it didn't, you know, make its budget back or anything like that. So, you know, it was pretty low. Mm. <laughs> so they're not really interested in giving money to people again like me who make films that don't make lots of money because it's about money. And I think film culture shouldn't be about profit all the time, you know. Every now and again, there's a there's a, a person that's put in charge that is allowed to. They have a little bit more freedom sometimes. Well, I think it's harder and harder now. Yeah. But well, at that time, it was Peter Sainsbury, yeah. and he'd come out from England. He'd worked with Peter Greenaway. He'd worked with um, Terence Davies. Terence Davies. He'd he'd worked with you know the avant-garde filmmakers in Britain, and he'd been in New Zealand too. He mm. and he he came to the the Australian Film Commission. He was a new broom, and he gave money to. Me, he gave money to Susan Dermody to make Breathing Underwater. He made gave money to Tracy Moffat to make Bedevil. He gave money to Susan Lambert and Sarah Gibson to make Landslides. Um, so he gave money to people who weren't getting money, who weren't getting the... because we weren't writing three-act structures with men with beards. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. No, I think that's, absolutely, <laughs> that's, that's absolutely right, and I, and I think that that that, that movement of uh, uh, filmmakers in the nineties and mid nineties, in particular, John Hughes also made. Yes, what, John Hughes. What I have that's written right. the year after yeah, you, uh, that's right. with, with the support of Peter. Yes. And um, Peter was trying. It was to a golden age for us. I yeah, can tell you. but it's it's something of a missed period in Australian film because obviously you know Peter wasn't successful in the long term with keeping that that program in place, and, yeah. and, and he and he wrote uh, two. Really critical papers no, in the late fabulous. 90s, early 2000s, which you've mentioned. Yeah, that's fantastic. He wrote two incredible papers where he really, which he gave uh, an address to Australian Screen Directors Association, and I can't remember what the other one was too. There, there I think were, it might have been the ADG. No, it wasn't the ADG. It might have been SPA, a Screen Producers I Association. Think it was, yeah. And they were, he, he looked at the films that had been made and he he talked about um, the problems in the way that film funding was going and he was incredibly critical and he was a sh so sharp and he kept saying things like why aren't there more, more movies like Hanukkah's The Piano Teacher? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine saying that to a, to a room full of um, people that yeah, they just don't watch those kinds of films? Don't watch those kind of films, what? And, um, yeah. So he was hated. He became hated, yeah. and um, and he walked out. He walked out of the of our industry. He 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 walked away. But then, of course, the next person to pick that up, and not that we can sort of go on this track for too much longer. One of the next people to pick it up is Bridget Aiken. Yes, 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 who's a friend of his. Yes, yeah. true. But Bridget, um, but she wasn't at AFC. But she was at SBS, and she she commissioned some very interesting low-budget sort of features at SBS when she was there. So there was a bit of a golden age at SBS with Bridget too. 
Which is also what got Heaven Sin, his first feature film. That's right, yes. Um, Beneath Clouds. Beneath Clouds. Uh, are there any, we, I think we have time for maybe one more question from the audience. I, not, I can't really see through the, the um, haze of lights, but just yell out if you've got a question. Okay, um, Marga, you were going to do, I heard, another film you were working on that didn't get up, and you actually um, got Marianne Faithful. Is that <laughs> Oh, this is interesting. I haven't heard this one. Oh, oh yeah. Right. Yes, you're right. What was that? Why didn't it? Oh, that's well. That's a difficult conversation to have. <laughs> well, we all have failures, but you know, it was. Um, I adapted a book um, by Dorothy Hewitt called *The Toucher*, and I got I had Marianne Faithful attached, and the it, it was about this old tart, you know, who <laughs> sort of had an affair with a young criminal. And, um, like, you know, she was in a wheelchair. She's like Dorothy. She's very sexual, like Dorothy. And I just loved the idea of this sort of older woman who was incredibly sexual having this incredible affair with this young criminal. And um, he, she touched him. She touched him in terms of poetry, in terms of literature. You know, he touched her. Mm. I mean, no, it, was, it wasn't... There was the sexuality, but there was a, a, another connection too. And I still remember the guy who was the head of film development at the Australian Film Commission when I was in the corridor there one day and he said, I found her sexuality repulsive. Wow. <laughs> so there was no way. Right. That's no sad. way it was going to get funded. So it was one, it's a failed project. I think I was possibly saved from myself, but anyway. <laughs> I would have liked to have seen that film. <laughs> Um, so I guess, uh, I mean, there's so many more things to talk about, but so I, I don't think we can really plug into too much more, but what are you working on now? Um, well, I'm working on a short film, um, which I'm editing myself, and um, it is a bricolage, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm using all my films as um, source material of images. And uh, the very first film I ever made, which I made here in, in um, Melbourne, was a film called We Aim to Please, which I made with uh, my friend Robin Laurie. And then later in Sydney, I made another short film called Shadow Panic. And I always thought, I want to make the third film in the trilogy. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. And um, it's, it's called Undercurrents, and it's about power and... and um, the kind of terrifying reality that we're in today and the sort of undercurrents of fascism, the undercurrents of destruction of the planets. It's, it's not a pretty image. But um, that's what I'm working on at the moment. It's a sort of poetic essay. It's 20 minutes long. I'm getting close to finishing it, but it might take another year to get all the permissions. But, you know, it's, um, it's, it has hope. We look forward to seeing it. <laughs> Margot, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>